Hello, everyone. Welcome to the second episode of Pizza Film School. Today, we're going to discuss the movie of the week, Ronan, directed by John Frankenheimer. My brother, Anthony, and I are joined by Steve McFeely and Christopher Marcus, our dear friends and the outstanding screenwriters behind Winter Soldier, Civil War, Infinity War, Endgame, and many other great films. India. Also, the highest grossing screenwriters in movie history. That's a, that's a badge of honor, gentlemen. That's a, uh, I don't know how that happened. We're all still working together uh, at Agbo, the studio that, uh, that we all founded, and uh, working on a lot of projects that, um, some secret projects that uh, we're gonna be excited to share with the world real soon here. Uh, why don't we get our, our pizza shout outs out of the way. Part of what we do at Pizza Film School is try to support local businesses by encouraging you to order some pizza um, after you watch us eat it and talk about a movie. I, I'm a shout out to Ant, our buddy, Richie Palmer, at Mulberry Street Pizza in Beverly Hills today. Chris, who do you got? I've got a little uh, John and Vinny's on Fairfax. Oh, wonderful. Oh, one of my favorites, along with Mulberry uh, Street. This is uh, Maria's Italian Kitchen in Sherman Oaks. I had my pizza earlier while I was watching Ronan, and that was super fine, which is very close to our offices mm -hmm. at Agbo. And I'm going to I know that many of you watching this aren't local to Los Angeles, so these places mean nothing to you. But, um, but I'll tell you why I like Superfine. Is I generally eat a vegan diet. I'm not strict, exclusive or strict, but I generally eat that way. And Superfine, like a lot of pizzerias around the country, are making, starting to make an amazing vegan pizza. Their vegan pizza has no cheese, but it has this very sort of spicy and flavorful mix of vegetables and olives and spices that it has an amazing kick to it and I love it. So I really appreciate pizzerias that figure out a badass vegan. Also, Superfine was founded by our very, very good buddy, Steve Sampson, one of the best chefs in Los Angeles, who owns Rasa Blue, which sits below Ag Bone, which we all eat at quite frequently. Um, all right, so we've done our, uh, our pizza roundup. Uh, let's get into Ronin, which is directed by John Frankenheimer, released in 1998 with a, a, a screenplay by a young screenwriter named J.D. Zeke and rewritten by David Mamet uh, under his pseudonym Richard Weiss. Why don't we start with the script, which I know is controversial. I happen to think uh, it's classic Mamet, impeccably structured, minimalist, efficient, muscular. Uh, I love that there's no backstory. I like marveling at the impeccable structure of that script that's peppered with a lot of mammotisms throughout the movie. And I've, I've listed a few of my favorites. I'll read them. You're worried about saving your own skin? I am. It covers my body. <laughs> a man and a woman going for a walk and all that entails. Of course, I'm afraid. You think I'm reluctant because I'm happy? Um, and, uh, and many, many more. Mm -hmm. uh, but Steve, why don't you tell us what you think of the script around it? It certainly hits all the marks. Like the midpoint is the double cross when Stellan Skarsgård just, you know, you know, I, very quickly screws them over. Like in a, in a way, like it does not hold your hand. And that, that is one of the big takeaways from the movie for me is that with very rare exceptions, does the movie try to hold your hand through stuff. <clears throat> and in fact, loses the strength of its convictions a few times when it does. Uh, clearly there's ADR at a few places where someone got panicked, you know. Um, there's a, there's sort of a midpoint test where they, you know, figure out where, uh, uh, how good the, the guards are uh, when they put, uh, he and uh, Natasha McElhinney uh, pose as a couple at the Hotel Majestic in Cannes and knock all the luggage over. And you're like, uh, like get, get the background. That's right. Oh, that, that, see, that's charming. That is absolutely charming. Yeah. Charming. <laughs> and, no, no, you. and by the way, so <laughs> Natasha and Steve, wasn't it so Natasha and Steve, Steve Rogers? And, oh, and well, I suppose there's a little bit of that. Yeah. If we're going to name check ourselves, <laughs> there's a little bit of that. Not it's even. Part, it's part of what we do on, on Pizza Film School is we, the, you know, these movies are, were influential movies for us as filmmakers. Um, Frankenheimer at the age he was when he directed this, it is a master class uh, in action directing by a true master of, uh, of that genre. And um, you know, if you, if you study the film, uh, there are a couple key elements that, uh, that he uses to create such incredible car chases. The sound design, I think, is as big of a star as De Niro is in the movie. 
and if you want a real lesson in sound design, study this movie. It uses a lot of dynamic range. There's a low, low bass in the engines. There's high sounds in the squeals, and he combines those two. The gunshots. De Niro's a machine gun. It sounds like a bass. It's so heavy, like the speakers were vibrating. And when I was watching that sequence, when I think they're in Nice, and he's shooting at the cops with that machine gun. The sound design is exceptional in the movie. Cars, um, cars never sounded so good. No. And by the way, I think this was the movie that cemented Audi as like the premier uh, European luxury car. I remember how much love Audi got off of this film. And when a movie can do that for a brand, it means that the movie struck a chord. Isn't that why Tony Stark drives them now? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the camera work in this film, Anth, do you notice the wide shots up front, the way that he shoots? Uh, Sean Bean and and Skarsgård at the beginning, he puts them in these like really almost warped wide shots. He's telling you who's going to betray the characters in the film in the first 10 minutes. He like continually shoots them almost in these grotesque close-ups where you can see like the sweat coming down Sean Bean's face. And I think it, it's very confident filmmaking uh, because he's tipping his hand, but he's doing it to, I think, heighten tension in the film because you could just feel the job going south from the first 10 minutes. So you know this isn't going to go well. Are you talking mostly about that, the first, sort of the uh, the gathering scene after the 10 minute open? It's yeah. the, it's, it's yeah, it's the gathering scene where right. they're, they're chatting. It's, it's just prior to the sequence where they go meet the guys under the bridge. Right, so what's that what? technique called when you put, like this, I just, again, this is, betrays my lack of actual film school. Like when you're, <laughs> That's why you've come to pizza film. That's why I've come to pizza film. Right. When my face <laughs> is here, right, and then over here mm -hmm. is uh, Sean Bean. You know, I think Orson Welles tried to do this where you. Yeah, sort no, of, it's been Citizen Kane. Yeah, sort of. It's so a diopter. Every, yeah, well, everybody was in focus, even though they wouldn't right. be. Now, Steve, this, Steve this, you've you've just composed a wonderful shot, by the thank way. Thank you. No, yeah, like this is not that hard. <laughs> um, there are there are two ways to achieve that. One is with a really wide lens. Okay, uh, that's what. I'm Right, and the other is with the diopter that can help. Um, and it, traditionally, Scorsese uses these quite effectively, but split frame diopters where focus uh, on this side is shallow for the person in the foreground and it's deep on this side for the person in the background, and you can hold them both in focus e even though they shouldn't be. Mm -hmm. I don't, I didn't think he was using diopters. He I didn't, no, he he didn't. I'm, I'm yeah. sorry, jumping the gun there, but he certainly staged it that way so that it forced me to watch both things in a way. I wouldn't watch both things if I were center frame, right? It's so dramatic, it's like it's really showy, frankly. That was interesting to me, particularly in that first scene because it's, it's cramming six different dudes together, basically, and you're trying to watch, you're looking for the mole, you're looking for the rat, you're you know, trying to figure out who's, who's who in this situation, and it's not, it wasn't sort of a standard, yeah. you know, two shot. For well, you. I think the whole movie's showy in a way because it, it's an, it feels like an exercise. Like there were stated parameters before they went, you know, we're not going to tell you a lot about who these people are. We're not going to tell you what they're after. Mm -hmm. You know, this is a movie about what you're watching at the time, which is one of the reasons why the end of the movie makes me cranky because it feels like it betrays that. But in, in some ways it also feels like they set out to make a seventies movie. Right. Like, like it seems to be like the biggest fault with this movie is that it didn't come out in 1975 because well, that was Frank and... Well, I got to tell you, everyone would revere Black it. Sunday, French Connection 2. Yeah, yeah. but right. that's kind of what gave me... That, I have to be honest with you, that's kind of what gave me such a thrill about this movie when it came out, because I remember coming of age in, like, the 80s, when you'd hear, like, all of a sudden the Stones or the Who would come out with a new song in the 80, early 80s. Yeah. And you would all of a sudden, even though this was a <laughs> band for, me, for my generation that felt like it, like, belonged to a time before you, Fair enough, but did they ever, were they ever putting out a song that was as good as their old song? <laughs> I mean, they were different. I, I listen, maybe, maybe this is more of a director's piece, this film. I happen to love the, as I said, the efficiency of the script. Yeah. Uh, and the, and the, you know, at times absurd dialogue that, you know, I find highly entertaining. Uh, but to, what's, but what's to, the other but to line? get a, get a, to get a great Frankenheimer movie in 1998, Fair enough, because he's coming off of, I want to say, Island of Dr. Moreau. I didn't think anyone got out of that island a lot. Well, it, it, <laughs> let me double check that. I Here I am on a... But yeah, he was, let's face it, he was kind of in director's jail, right? Like he had, yeah. he had sort of gotten to a point where he was working. Well, and he went back to uh, 
he went back to the genre he had success. Yeah, yeah for sure. You know what I was going to bring up, Joe, when you were mentioning earlier about that opening scene of the film? And it's so funny because this is something that the four of us talk about a lot, but, um, you know, you like many times you consciously steal from other artists and sometimes you unconsciously steal from other artists. And in that opening scene, you know, he does these observation, these high observational shots as they're all starting to gather in the cafe in that opening scene of the yeah. movie. And they're sort of like these bizarre shots that aren't from anybody's point of view, but they have this feeling of observation to them. And it adds this layer of tension to what's happening because you feel like they're being watched. You feel like there's some other element at play here and you don't know what it is or when it's going to introduce itself into the narrative. And we use that same technique in Winter Soldier uh, when Cap returns to his apartment uh, and Nick Fury's there waiting for him. We did this high observational shot of right. Cap as he's pulling up on his motorcycle. And again, it's, it feels strange in the moment because you don't know whose point of view this is or why, why am I looking at this moment from this point of view, but it introduces this feeling of observation. I remember always loving that from that scene in Ronin. And I, when we did it in Winter Soldier, I wasn't really thinking of that, consciously thinking of that, but subconsciously thinking. We, we borrow a lot from this film. I mean, I would say that the, the car chase in Winter Soldier is, is directly uh, borrowed from Ronin that the visceral quality of it and the dynamic camera work. The tunnel sequence in, in, in Civil War. That's right, tunnel sequence in right. Civil War. And I'll, I'll admit this, the uh, screenplay for Extraction is, uh, is influenced by the sort of minimalist efficiency uh -huh. and lack of backstory. Uh, you know, a highly impressionable movie on us when we saw it at the age we saw it at. The only yeah. thing about this movie that I don't track is that opening where De Niro puts his gun outside and then goes inside and then comes outside and gets his gun. Like, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not sure what the, is he, is he going, is he worried that he's going to get frisked? So he puts the gun outside, but is he going to kind of run back outside to get the gun in case there's trouble? <laughs> that was, you know, like he said, he did never, never go in somewhere without knowing how you're getting out. Well, it begs the that, question. Yeah, this is sort of, know. this like, <laughs> if, <laughs> If we were to give you a, a scene where five strangers, you know, meet in a public place and then wait for the things to close and, and, uh, and then get in a van, I believe you would ask me, why are they meeting in a public place? And I would have no good answer for that. <laughs> no, there's, I mean, there's, a, there's a lot of stuff where you go, where you're not meant to think about it. Like, right. for sure. Did she get a job in a bar? I don't know. <laughs> in order to have that meeting? The bar owner is dead in the closet. <laughs> I mean, clearly, listen, clearly they were, they got a, a message delivered that said, meet in this bar at X time, yeah. right? Well, she was sure. delivering the message, maybe. It's, it's safer, it's safer right. than a warehouse. Okay, I'll get, to, I'll get to what makes me cranky about the end of the movie. Oh, you know, I can't yeah. wait. <laughs> well, because it made me go back and think about stuff I don't think the movie really wanted me to think about. Mm -hmm. It's when he reveals he's still working for the CIA. So then I had to go, oh, so now I got to reconsider everything I saw that he was playing this double role. And I had come to really enjoy the exercise of watching just the Ronin, the, the right, betrayed character, people who were right. living this life I was watching. And I didn't like being pulled out of that and told he actually has a hidden agenda. Cause then it it's made me go that. back and go, well, that was a really convoluted way of going about your agenda. Like really you then hung out only with the, with the French guy instead of getting the resources of the CIA to maybe find out where that's a studio. <laughs> it does. It's what it felt like is the the nineties reaching into the seventies and going, we need him to be more of a hero. It's this can't end that blank. Right. He has to stand for something. I think you're right but, with that. But I also think it made him less of a hero. Well, it made me go back and look at all the collateral damage in the movie. Yeah, which is all the that's, civilians being killed. Right. Going, right. Like, wow, he's a colossal asshole. <laughs> <laughs> if, if, if Frankenheimer had made the movie in the 2010s, yes, they wouldn't have had any of that. Yeah, that's right. No, he has, I mean, there is a lot of innocents getting killed in this movie. Including, you know, a, a Olympic skater, Katarina Vick. Murdered on the ice! <laughs> Murdered on the ice! <laughs> I did not know that's where we were going. <laughs> um, or all the innocent folks murdered at... Uh, what, uh, the Coliseum place. Yeah, the Coliseum. Mm -hmm. That's another thing that I almost liked about it. They're not that good at it. Yeah. They, you've hired these people. They plan to take the car in the middle of town next to a cafe. 
where they're just going to slaughter a bunch of people. <laughs> By the way, it was always one of the more disturbing shots from an action film. And I don't know why, but every time I watch it, it's when that car crashes into all those uh, street side tables at the cafe yeah. in Nice. Oddly, everyone talks about the car chases. And I looked at the questions that were sent. And there are a lot of them. Oh, yeah, we have our questions. Yeah. I kind of uh, checked out during the car chases. Oh. The parts I really enjoyed were the, there was a lot of cameo actors who I really enjoyed. Michael Lonsdale. Michael movie. Lonsdale, Lonsdale. Who I think I've only ever yeah. other seen in Moonraker. Yeah. Great. Day of the Jackal. <laughs> He's fantastic. Yeah. That's, that's one of our Park favorite actors. A cameo, but I, I loved when he showed up. Um, and gives, and after the, gives the Ronin speech. There's a very satisfying moment where she gets in the car and she finds the also extremely oddly cast driver guy with his throat cut. I think he was a stunt driver. Like there's something it different about like him. Frankenheimer hired his neighbor. Or yeah. something. Mean, like, it's just like, mean Larry? Yeah. yeah. Hey Larry, you want to be in a movie? <laughs> Why not? I think he I did his own his look. He's got <laughs> like a pot belly. Like, yeah, he look, he looks his, like the sports like a, reporter for your local paper. Feels like a retired uh, uh, driver, you know, either a uh, yeah. sports car driver. Yeah. Or like a, I thought it was fascinating casting. Something I remember from the first time I saw the film, I was like, that's a zag. I wasn't expecting yeah, that. It was weird because you recognize everybody on the crew and then you're like, and that guy? And, and, okay. <laughs> and this guy. <laughs> um, <laughs> But when he's killed and she finds Jonathan Price in the back of the car and he just says in his weird little Irish accent, drive. And it's really <laughs> creepy. Like, yeah, I'm, I'm a real asshole. But by the way, classic midpoint moment, they reveal Jonathan Price as a villain in the middle mm. of the movie, right? He doesn't show up until the midpoint. It is that, well, yeah, the, I was just- At the beginning. Yeah. She meets oh, on, on an escalator. Oh, that's right. Oh, that's yeah. right. And that's he right. pops yeah. back up again. In the metro. Later in the right. yeah. That's when the plan becomes, the villain's plan becomes clear. The, yeah. the, the only moment that like, I felt like, had, you know, as the years have uh, passed since I first saw the movie that probably didn't age as well as the rest of the film is when De Niro grabs the case and he's covered in spray paint. And that's how he realizes it's a bomb and he throws it under the car. Right. <laughs> there are a bunch of deductions. Impeccable, impeccable timing. Yeah. Right. Feels like Mamma was running out of time. <laughs> uh, on that rewrite. well i mean yeah. what ages it is there's a couple of things but uh it's they don't do her any favors no. right the idea that at the end she goes won't you come away with me yeah <laughs> like, yeah i, I enjoyed her at the part beginning of your relationship with him means, <laughs> makes you think that that was never mammoth specialty writing with no, specialty. well yeah. it turns out actually i enjoyed her at the beginning when she wouldn't give anybody anything in it was when they tried to generate a, uh, a relationship between the two of them that wouldn't exist. There was an alternate ending, which I looked up on YouTube. Um, she got killed, right? Uh, and that's the implication, yeah. So at the very end, when he's waiting for her in the cafe with Jean Renault, uh, and he says she's not gonna come, you cut up the stairs, that really nice long staircase, and she's having a hard time because she's supposed to go down and she's thinking about it and she can't and she won't, and she's, this is her struggle, it's all intercut. And she decides not to, very sad, walks up the hill, and then like a car comes around and says, this is what we do to traitors, and they grab her, they pull her in the van. So you know, it's, it, I guess I don't miss it, but it was, it, they certainly had other plans at some yeah. point. Instead they had the, so odd that I almost liked it, sudden voiceover from Jean Renault as he goes up the stairs. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a studio note, obviously. Right? But I mean, it, it always, again, if it came out in 1975 and they did that, I would go, man, you could do anything in the 70s. <laughs> it, was like very, it was very shoot the piano player all of a sudden. Yeah. <laughs> was he, Steve, was he coming off of Dr. Moreau? What was he coming off? He replaced Richard Stanley. So yes, uh, I mean, okay. I don't know how much you but want he to He tried to clean it up. Yeah. But, yeah, I but think if he was, was a little bit movie jail, it explains some of the odd notes in this. Uh, yeah, right, because he goes, yeah, his 80s were The Challenge, The Holcroft Covenant, 52 Pickup, Dead Bang, and then uh, he did Year of the Gun, which I've never seen, but got some kind of love. Um, and, uh, and then uh, cleaned up Dr. Moreau. Ronan, Reindeer Games, Ambush, and then he was doing some HBO stuff, some oh, pretty good right. stuff. Reindeer Games, I forgot. Yeah. yeah. Path to War was a good one. And then he did a George Wallace 
sort of uh, as a mini series. I think. Classic old school director just worked his ass off. Uh, we're going to jump into some questions um, that have been posted to Instagram. The first one is uh, JC Yerdy at JC Yerdy says thoughts on the car chase, how those seem to work well while other chases don't. I mean, I think it's, you know, it's the dynamic we're camera work. It's these. the sound design. I'll say that uh, over and over again. That, you know, I mean, that's the thing about, Goodfellas about are, Frank Goodfellas and Hammer. Two yeah. movies to study for sound design. What's the other one? Say again? Goodfellas in this. Goodfellas. Are yeah. both exceptional. But Frank, that's the thing about Frankenheimer. He is, and he gets credited for this a lot, but he, he is a master craftsman. And he uses the tools of filmmaking in a very sophisticated, effective way. You know, there, you can, again, you can learn a lot about filmmaking from watching his films, watching how he uses sound design, watching the edits. There's a, some magnificent edits in here. I love that edit where I think she's like sort of making like a cutthroat motion and you cut to a car whizzing by on the cut. It's just really, it's just the way it pops. It's yeah, really the way he underscores things it. Like that. Even a car going around the corner and he'll just get, you know, it's probably, it's not realistic, but he would just get a bassy deep rev out of the engine as it comes around the corner. The, my favorite- And it goes quiet, it goes loud, design. quiet, loud, quiet. Yeah, it's, it right. does, it's like, it's super dynamic. What's the, do you guys know the, the uh, isn't there sort of a, a famous uh, drive through Paris at oh, like yeah, that five in the morning? Awesome. Do you know yeah. this? You it's talking about the YouTube video where the guy filmed no, himself? It's a, it's, it's a French director in the 60s. Oh yeah. It's a, it's a, uh, dash mounted camera and he takes off at top speed like at dawn from his apartment and drives all the way to Montmartre in one shot and it's insane it's yeah he's going to die at at every moment and like people get right in front of him, and it's all real wow um, uh, and so I'm reminded of that um a because of this because of the I don't know if that's even sound designed Chris I think that's just no, it's probably just the camera and the engine. But, you know, he goes around corners, it gets quieter. He goes straight away, it gets louder. Is not this car chase, um, it feels more realistic. And I'm wondering if that's because you're in the car more with the actors. And I'm wondering if that's because there, if this is early use of, and I don't know this, I'm talking on my ass, early use of uh, sort of a right side driver stunt guy so that De Niro's over here, acting his ass off, but someone over here is really driving the car. He, uh, yes, I'm, sh I'm certain that they were doing that. Well, the uh, the, actually, it's a fa one of the famous things about the film is that there was a famous French race car driver, and I don't know his name, but he was the stand-in driver for those things, where he would drive the actors around at like amazingly dangerous speeds. But he was such an expert driver, it, was, it worked. And mm -hmm. camera placement, I mean, the way they're strapping cameras to cars, they're getting low rear mounts, front mounts, you know, mm -hmm. they're right in there. I mean, what's really dangerous, so you can see it where the grill of a car is getting right up in the lens. You know, they're on the dirt road going 50 mm -hmm. miles an hour. Those are two cars just dancing with each other. One's a camera car, one's the real car. Um, uh, is that different or, or uh, an advance from, say, the French Connection? It's in advance. I mean, if you look at French Connection, it's built between um, Hackman's face. There's a, an amazing camera side camera mount by the wheel. Yeah. Right, looking forward, uh, and then some exterior shots. You know, and and some looking up at the train car. It's definitely an advancement. Like the 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 artistry of the French Connection chase is almost in its limitations, and how expertly he. He pieces together a, a, a right. A, a it's nearly right? right. This is like there's you know you're in a helicopter for 24 frames. Now you're down low and the car, and the grill of the car is you know racing up against the camera car. Now you're in the car with De Niro. It's it's a little bit more dynamic, although the editing, as Anth mentioned, is extremely artful. It's very thoughtful editing, uh, but the sound design is what makes it work. If you cut all that together without the growling and intense sound design, it would look like a car commercial. It literally like, you know, we've sat in edit rooms before where you don't have sound design on a scene like the, the one or uh, that, that Hargrave did an extraction. Mm -hmm. When that first came in without the sound design, it, you know, you're in a bit of a flop sweat going, oh my God, can we make this work? Mm -hmm. You know, and then we handed it to our amazing team 
uh, and they brought it back and went, all right, we've got it. And it really is, that's what sound and music can do for you. The way it dimensionalizes um, scenes. And I'll tell you, my favorite piece of sound design in this movie is literally like eight frames or 12 frames long. It's in the tunnel. You remember when they're in the chase in the tunnel and you hear yeah. the cars going by and they literally go, like they're like this quick and it just happens over and over again. Yeah. And you, it like, it accentuates the speed yeah. of the chase. And it's, uh, it's quite brilliant. What do we feel, what do we think about the setting, the European setting? Are we tired of Europe? Oh, so it's 1998. I mean, part of me as a complete cynic kind of went, someone decided to go have, right? go to the south of France and work. <laughs> uh, but that's, that was, that's a lot of work, that movie. I mean, like that, that. I, I would argue though, that this, well, did this inspire the Bourne films? Uh, fair enough. Like certainly they owe a debt, right? I'm clearly. Well, right. I, do, I, do, I do think the setting, I do think the setting was kind of, was organic to the concept of the movie and part of what was clever about the film in the sense that there's this network of spies that hmm. was sort of hyperactive during the Cold War. And as the Cold War has ended, they're sort of right. No, they're Ronin now. They don't have masters yeah. to serve any longer. Fair enough. If, and, you, if you've shaken yeah. out of various uh, spy organizations, you probably didn't all end up in Philadelphia, no. right? Well, yeah, no. you ended up in the south of France. You know, something well, like that. one ancient narrow streets really help with car chases. Well, yeah. because it just makes That's it true. that, that yes. much more horrifying. Well, yeah, for the sure. niche chase. De Niro is is the big bull American in the China shop of 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 France, it kind of works that he's there. It wouldn't have been as effective elsewhere. He's speaking French, though. Like, keep French. French. Yeah. Yeah. You know, oh, what my like, favorite French. The 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 movie is "C'était un rendezvous" by Claude Lelouch from 1976. It's eight minutes long. It's cool. Everyone, go check yeah. it out. Yeah. Yeah. I think I think this is the only movie you can see Robert De, De Niro speak French in. Is that right? <laughs> Uh, you know what my favorite casting in this film is? It's the guy with the case. I don't. I just love his. Oh, face. the bald guy. Yeah, the bald guy with the sunglasses. I'm like, yeah, he's cool. <laughs> I love it. Every time I watch the movie, I go, "That's the best casting I've ever he's seen." For a guy who doesn't say a word. I also love the Russian at the end. The guy who yeah. lets lets his ice skater girlfriend get killed. That's <laughs> <laughs> amazing. He got a Chilean passport. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He like uh, I love he calls his bluff and just lets him shoot. That's right. <laughs> There's a okay um, from Adam, I, went, Adam. I went through some of these questions. There's a lot of like we've touched on a lot of them, but one of the things we haven't that I think is really interesting in these questions from Cherry Burns thirty five. Yes. What was in the briefcase? Mm. Everybody has to answer. Well, this is part of the question. This is I don't want to. It's it's when you never tell me you have announced it's an exercise. And so that it's not about story or character in some ways. It's about sitting down for two hours and, and enjoying yourself. It's about the puzzle. And that's a perfectly fine type of movie. There are big, successful movies. A lot of Tarantinos are like that. Um, Usual Suspects is like that, it, it, where you're sort of meant to be removed from the characters because if you don't tell me what they're after, how can I give a crap? Um, so I have to enjoy other things about the movie. It, it is. It's making the MacGuffin irrelevant. Right. right. Yeah. Like right. it doesn't matter what's in the case. It's it's about the characters and 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 what's driving them to get it. Uh, and you know, Pulp Fiction came out three years before this or four years before it, so there's an epidemic of movies about cases with you know and stuff in them. Stuff in them. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's but that, that's a good point though. Like, because there's certain. This is '98, and it feels older than that. Right. Yeah, well, and it's I, it's it's Frankenheimer's old moves from the '70s. That's the thing. So, like, I was thinking, like, Heat and Seven came out three years earlier, and this feels far older than than those. Mm -hmm. movies. Vintage. Yeah. yeah, that's for sure. In a way that is distressing to you, or are you, um, are you appreciative well, of it. So I think it classes. turns it into a chamber piece. I think yeah. it's like this is for people who enjoy the '70s movies. I am one of those people but it's not a reinvention of anything. And it's, it's, does, it doesn't move, it certainly doesn't move anything forward. Off of that, here's an interesting question. At Philly Warrior 215 asks, Ronan and Mad Max Fury Road are two of my favorite action mm -hmm. movies and both lack CGI, although we- Oh, that's not true at all. Mad Max Fury Road <laughs> lacks CGI, but- 
No. Um, do you think there is something lost when action movies use CGI? That's an interesting question. I mean, potentially, if you're dealing with something you could have otherwise shot. I mean, I think there's plenty of things, you know, you can't do those things for real. They don't exist. I don't know. I think I can get as bored in a live car chase as I can in a CGI car chase sometimes. Um, what, what would tie together, like, what is it about a sequence, no matter whether it's CGI or not, mm -hmm. that that allows you to follow action. I mean, I know, I know we all have a rule we follow, which is you have to track character advanced story. Yeah. yeah. I think your brain can only take so much. I wonder. Action. Yeah. Here's a, here, this came up, I think a lot with the Peter Jackson um, Hobbit movies. Um, would you say that if you can put a, sh uh, it, it, should the move, if it's a move that's being done by a computer, should it mimic the move a camera can make? If you know what I mean? Like, so like, if it's, a, if it's a move that the camera could never possibly do because it was impossible, does that take you out of the movie in some way because your brain goes, oh, that's clearly fake? Uh, I think it takes some people out of the movie. We do discuss that quite a bit when we're on set uh, or when we're in, or when we're in a, um, uh, you know, a, a room uh, approving uh, visual effects for a film um, in a review where we'll go, well, who's operating that camera? Mm -hmm. like, well, how is that possible? Uh, and, and, you know, we like to try to, uh, you know, apply physics to our, our camera work. It's not always the case. You can't do that necessarily when you're tracking Iron Man who's flying at 150 mm -hmm. miles an hour because I don't know that we have any equipment that could actually track him. Mm -hmm. um, in the air, uh, but you try to you try to subdue it or or bring it into a set of rules as much as possible. I think you go back and look at the Lord of the Rings. Peter Jackson uses a lot of flying camera work yeah. you know, that I think is untethered and dips and weaves and moves mm -hmm. through and around characters and in ways that are and highly effective Oscar winning films. Right. And well, and, and it's genre too, right? That's a fantasy movie in a way. Like you wouldn't do that in Winter Soldier. Right, that's yeah. meant. To wasn't be, part of the rules for Winter yeah, Soldier. Not, I mean, not, yeah. Winter Soldier had Ronin esque rules, which yes. are try to keep it as grounded as possible, try to do everything as real as possible. Obviously, you know, I, I think that's why some people who love the first two acts of Winter Soldier don't love the third act, is because it, right. it gets very CG on you. I, I love the third act, you know, yeah. but I, I like CG uh, spectacles when, uh, when, you know, they're done correctly and when there's good storytelling in them. So I think it's just an issue of taste. I don't know. Uh, Chris, what do you think? Well, I think the camera is already doing stuff the human eye can't do. So I think we made that jump a long time ago. You know, if a camera comes from the street into a window, I can't do that. I don't like showy camera work in general. Like long wonders, there are exceptions, but they it feels like the director wants me to think about them, not the movie. And then I'm like, well, I don't care that you didn't turn the camera off. You know, it, as long as it still has a visceral feeling, as long as it feels like people are obeying the laws of physics to the point where they could get hurt if they bump into something. I don't mind CGI. It's made our career. What am I, what am I gonna do? <laughs> let, me, let me ask this question. This is a good question. Uh, TV poll uh, underscore RT fave two. Uh, if you had to reboot Ronan today, who would you cast? Huh. Hmm, okay. Ryan Gosling. That's your answer to everything. Yeah, I want people for the story, man, I want people who are gone to seed. So who was hot 10 years ago who now has a bit of a pot belly, you know, like. Yeah. Oh, that's a good point. If it, you're right. It should be people who you knew had a long career. And, uh, it, it, you know, again, if you keep it, you're rebooting it, but it's a period piece. It's post-Cold War, that kind of stuff. Yeah, everyone should be in their 40s and have had who a would that be? Um, us. Oh, I have I cast all of us. In. That's right. I, well, guys like... Um, I don't know. I think there's another Kevin Costner movie out there where where he's put upon and he's uh, down in his forties. I know, he, but uh, that's a good point. Um, Downey. <laughs> Downey. I'd like to see Downey in a stripped down action movie. I think it'd be cool. Um, you just where have he has like three talk. three lines in the whole movie. By the way, <laughs> I, I think that Costner. is a great point, right? And like in a in a, a bare knuckle kind of uh, raw bullet esque action film, yes, that'd be a really interesting role for Robert. 
This is a good question from at David Doubler. Is somebody trying to make a career as a screenwriter in Hollywood and Ronan being the kind of movie I want to write? Is there still a market for this type of movie in an IP and temple world? And I would, I would say, well, I would say yes. Extraction just showed you that you know a stripped down uh, thriller with um, uh, some nods to character, but it's not a, like a huge character piece. It's like one interesting guy at the center and. He, with one one devastating with, piece of backstory. Yeah, and and, go, and and is and that movie just goes, you know? Um, uh, it, it there is a mark, and I think that what's interesting is in that transition that's happened over the last twenty years as IP and tentpole filmmaking has taken over. While uh, digital distribution was rising, I think there was a a lack of of, of adult thriller action. Fair. Right. Comedies have, have disappeared. They're almost extinct. Romantic comedies have disappeared from the marketplace. And I think people are starving for that kind of content. So I think absolutely there's room for it in this world. I also think, you know, there are huge stylistic differences, but is it that big of a jump from this to John Wick? That's a, a lot of disparate characters, not a huge backstory. Driven oh, by it's just, it's just world building. Yeah, that's IP now. Very but, different tone. Yeah. You know, how very yeah. Yeah. different yeah. tone, but like I could make IP out of uh, out of uh, Ronan. Yeah, I yeah. mean, uh, there's a graphic novel applicated to John Wick. That that's really that's what elevates it into sort sure. of event space, yeah. right? But your otherwise, it is a minimalist story. Not a ton of backstory, right? P perhaps you know one, one of the more um, uh, wink wink MacGuffins in the last decade. Oh, it's the dog? Right, yeah. The dog. It's a, lot, it's a lot easier to follow the plot. You come for the pure kinetic action of it. You don't come for, you know, finally the fulfillment of his emotional arc. Right. Mm -hmm. But aren't you, yeah, aren't you, isn't there a balance about it? it? I mean, the more I have to think about character and story, the less I can be present in visceral action, right? So, and the more screen time you have to spend selling the audience on. Um, the character and story. Right? Oh, and I guess it totally, but it totally depends, right? Like your best action, your best action beats are going to be with characters you deeply care about mm -hmm. and that you've gotten to know. Like, and I won't even say like, you know, Steve Rogers and the Hammer necessarily, but like Kevin Costner um, in Untouchables, you know, I desperately want him to win in the third act. I want him to yeah, save- Another mammoth script. Like, what? Yeah. <laughs> well, that's the thing. I would say his finest screenwriting moment. Yeah. That movie. Now, but okay, but take the French connection as an example. I mean, I think that Friedkin, you know, reinvented the action film with that movie. Uh, he was a documentary filmmaker before he made it. Mm -hmm. It's got a docu style, it sort of slots into the story and then exits, right? It enters and then exits without. Yeah. You know, a ton, you know, what do you know about Gene Hackman is, you know, he meets girls on bikes and has mm -hmm. you know, sex with them. And then, you know, uh, wears a, a Santa Claus suit when he busts, uh, right. uh, yeah. you know, dudes. Like, there's, no, there's not a ton of, he's a driven, you know, character, almost borderline personality disorder. Uh, but he's fascinating to watch. Yeah, I mean, none of that means I don't care about him, you know. Right. It's just... The, it comes down to acting. I care about Jean Reno and De Niro, and I even cared about Sean Bean. He seems so screwed up and clearly is a drug addict, and you're wondering, how the hell did this guy wind up in this position? Uh, Stellan Skarsgård is huge, a hugely damaged person. I don't know what the hell happened to him, but he's, he's crazy, and I don't even know why he's doing what he's doing, because he doesn't seem capable of enjoying the money if he ever got it. I'm interested in most most of the people in that. Is any is any of that in the script, or is that just because you like the actors and they're doing good work? I, I think it's a, a good yeah, question, probably. But it, I mean, that it has been given a chance to come out because they're not being weighted with having to deliver tons of uh, plot and, sure. and garbage. You sure. Know? Well, it's a real estate issue, right? Like, yeah. I don't know that, the, like, the French Connection's length is the correct length. And, the, you know, I get the just enough story that I need to move me forward in it. And then, he's, like you said, it's an amazing performance by Hackman. The, it's this, literally, is like, let's watch a driven man fail. You know, yeah. that's really what the, the ethos of that movie is. Uh, and it's fascinating to watch him. But, not, you know, it's a good point, too, because I feel like, 
we get very myopic and more myopic as, as volumes of info, you know, volumes of information cascade at us through the internet that we, we get more myopic about, uh, taste and we try to, mm -hmm. we, we try to define things in the smallest sentences and the fewest amount of words. Um, because we just don't have time, but not every movie is, should be the same movie. Right. Not every right. movie should follow the same structure, attempt to be the same thing. I mean, you know, it's sort of like become a mantra now about character and emotion and backstory. I don't always, I don't need that every time I sit down and watch a film. I don't want it. And I don't yeah. know that audiences want it necessarily because I think they all have a, a PhD in storytelling and they don't need to sit there while I spoon feed them information that they're already ahead of. Right. And they're checked out on me because they know it. They instinctually know it already. I mean, that's the thing about genre. When you make something in a genre, you can dispense with a lot of the setup because people are so familiar with it. So you can, you know, you actually can get to a much more interesting place if you're willing to, you know, if it's a vampire movie, I don't need to tell you what a vampire is. I don't need to tell you, you know, any of the rules. Right. Um, but isn't it a, com if, particularly if you're going to use world worn, and listen, who are we talking to? This is the four of us talking here. We're, we're, we make our living. Filmmakers. But um, we make our living doing what? In, we're in a particular genre at the, oh, yeah. lately, right? Um, but isn't it incumbent upon you as a filmmaker, if you're going to use well worn genre, to like bring something new to it? To bring, like, I would argue that as a political thriller, Winter Soldier succeeds not because it hits the buttons of the political thriller, but because it's, it's woven it into a, a superhero movie with a character that people inherently like and are rooting yeah. for is an interesting problem. It's not the same story. Like my problem with Ronan is, is I've seen this movie before and I saw it, I saw it 20 years earlier. And you're not so, compelled enough by De Niro's character to care? It didn't, I, I, I kind of defy you to tell me anything new that came out of this. Like sure there's a no, cigarette with genre. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just mean that it's, it's, it's perfectly fine. It's the finest movie. It's fine. But like, it's not, it doesn't reinvent anything. It doesn't, it's not a blend of anything. Nothing extra come in, came out of it. Like, no. And, well, no, you're making good points. You're making very good points about it, yeah. But does everything need to be new? That's the question. Like, so is it okay if I just tell you a detective story and, and it looks a lot like the other detective hey, stories? Depends on how you know it's okay. And isn't that somebody gives you but with longer shots and slower, you know, and, and long acting moments. And it's, it's just dressed up in a different way. If somebody gives you the money to make the movie and then uh, after you've made the movie and you want to make another movie, somebody gives you the money to make another movie, then it's okay. <laughs> Right, on that note, right. <laughs> we, we wrap this and up. As long as, long as you can, if it, it's right. all about being able to make a movie if you want to make a movie. Get away with it. That's right. Uh, Never make your masterpiece. Moving along to, to next week's film, uh, one that was hugely inspirational on me. I don't know if Anth uh, loved this one as much, but I've probably seen this film more than any other movie I've ever seen. And I'm the kind of guy who likes to watch movies 20 or 30 times and study them. But Evil Dead is one of my all-time favorites. I love the camera work. What an incredible debut for Raimi. The high concept of the film is still one of the most harrowing uh, high concepts uh, in horror that, I, I can, uh, that, that I've seen in a film. Yeah. Where you basically have to kill your friends uh, as they slowly uh, turn into uh, demons and try to kill you. I'm looking forward to watching. I, I haven't watched it since high school. And... Even then, I had seen Evil Dead 2 prior, which is just kind of a remake with a higher budget. Um, and I know back then I preferred Evil Dead 2. So More sophisticated camera work and a, a, I think a sense of humor is more refined in Evil Dead 2. But there's something yeah. very raw mm -hmm. about Evil Dead 1 that was like, you know, just took over, took, took the horror world by storm when the movie came out. Yeah. And this is... Ramey and, and, and the Coens were pioneering that, that board cam where they would put a camera on a two by four, mm -hmm. put an operator on either side of it and, and chase. It's yeah. the same shot from uh, Raising Arizona where he's running through the house 
uh, Raimi uses it to great effect when he's in the POV of the demon as it chases people throughout Evil Dead. Um, so there is, there's some cutting edge uh, camera techniques that he used in the spirit of uh, independent filmmaking that have had a lasting impact. And it gave so, the world Bruce Campbell. Exactly. Yeah, there you go. Uh, all right. So thanks for tuning in, everyone. Uh, Till next time. Uh, we'll see you next week. Uh, Pizza Film School uh, signing out. See you guys. I got to figure out how to hang up. <laughs>